Now when we see that errors in frames can be detected and that loss of frames can be detected by means of a sequence number, we shall look at how we can handle the errors. Because it's clear for any communication system that the data that has been sent from one party should be received correctly by the other party. There are two principal ideas for handling errors. One is called forward error correction. It means that you use some type of error correcting codes, codes that, that can help you to identify where the bit errors are located. Because if you know where a bit error has occurred, you simply flip that bit. It's a location of the errors that's important for the code. It would be used to replace the CRC with some other redundancy. You need more redundancy to correct the errors in a frame than what you need with the CRC to detect the errors in a frame. The forward error correction needs to have some model of, of the link. You have to know what is the error probability so that you can design the code so that it's powerful enough to handle all the errors that you could expect to see in a frame. Or at least that you can correct them with some given probability of remaining bit errors that cannot be corrected. The other method is called retransmission or automatic repeat request. And this is what we will present here in this module. It can be used both for bit errors when you detect that the frame is not correct, or it can be used for missing frames when you see from the sequence numbers that one or several frames have been lost. There is also a combination of the two called hybrid RQ. Maybe use a forward error correction to correct a few bit errors per frame, but not expecting it to, to deal with all situations that occur. Instead, you have the ARQ, which then uses retransmission to handle the errors which could not be corrected. Automatic repeat request, ARQ. So we here assume the error detection that I presented before, uh, so that frames with errors have been discarded and they are missing from the stream of frames that come in. We base the protocols on the flow control that I have presented. And now we combine error control together with the flow control. So the basis is the algorithms for flow control. We start with the stop and wait flow control and develop that into something called stop and wait ARQ. It's sometimes also referred to as alternating bit protocol, because since you only send one frame at a time, it's enough to have sequence number of one bit. So you send frame 0 or 1, and then you alternate 0 and 1. For the same reason as we devised a sliding window protocol for flow control to get the better utilization, we also need to have a sliding window with respect to ARQ to get the better throughput. There are two variants, go back N and selective reject. I will spend most time on go back N, but I will mention how select reject differs from go back N. So here we have again the diagram with the two time axes. So time progresses from top to bottom and a frame moves from sender to receiver, of course, arriving sometime later than it has been sent. Let's see what would happen if we run stop and wait flow control without any extra mechanism to handle errors. Reminded that, that we developed the flow control by assuming that errors did not occur. All frames were delivered and they were delivered correctly. Here is not the case, so let's see what, what can happen. The sender has a variable, which is the sequence number of the last frame that it sent. And it also keeps a copy of the frame, because it has not been acknowledged. Frame 0 has been sent, and this is the frame that the receiver is waiting for. So its state variable R0 is corresponding to the frame that it will receive. It's now ready to receive frame 1, so therefore it sends an acknowledgment indicating that it's ready to receive 1. The sender now sends frame 1, and it updates its state variable to 1. So the frame 1 is lost for some reason. So what happens? The sender does not receive an acknowledgment, but this is perfectly OK. It might simply think that the re receiver is not ready to receive another frame. The receiver will wait, because it has sent an acknowledgment for frame 1, but it doesn't know that sender ha whether the sender has any data to send. So it simply assumes that the sender doesn't have any data, and it waits. So the two parties wait indefinitely in this protocol. So this indicates the mechanism that we need to add to flow control in order to handle the errors and the losses. If we don't want to wait indefinitely, what we do we do? Well, we set an alarm. We have a timer, and we set that timer when the frame is sent. We stop the timer when the acknowledgment is received, and if the timer times out, then we will retransmit the frame. So let's see what happens after timeout. Frame 1 is resent. 
I mean, it has been stored in a copy at the sender, and it corresponds to what the receiver is waiting for. So the receiver will progress and now send an acknowledgement asking for the next frame, which will be number zero with the two sequence numbers, zero and one. And then the protocol progresses. You now need to have acknowledgements with a richer semantic than for the flow control, because you have two cases that you have to distinguish. One is a regular one, that the receiver is ready to receive next frame, meaning also that the prior frame has been correctly received. But there's also now the case where it acknowledges a frame that has arrived, but it wants to signal that it's not ready to receive a next frame. And therefore, we need to have an acknowledgement for that. If the receiver has sent a receiver not ready to do flow control on the sender, when it's ready to receive again, it will simply send another acknowledgement of the other sort, saying that it's ready to receive with the sequence number it's waiting for. So this is very simple. So let's see what happens if an acknowledgement is lost instead. We start in the same way as before, but now the acknowledgement for frame zero is lost. We now assume, of course, that we have implemented the protocol as uh, was described on the previous slide. So there is a timer that was set when F1 was sent out. And after some time, there will be a timeout. And uh, F1 will be resent. Now, however, re the receiver has already received F1. Its state variable is zero, and this is the only frame that it will receive. So when it sees frame one, it will simply discard it. And it will send acknowledgement for frame zero. And this is the next frame from the sender side that it will send. So the protocol works as we expect. It handles loss of frames by timeout, and it handles loss of acknowledgement by timeout in the same way. Consider here that the receiver does not need to have a timeout because the receiver cannot say that when it sends an acknowledgement, it would expect a frame to arrive within a certain time because it cannot know whether the sender has data to send or not. So how should we set this timeout? What happens if it's too long or too short? Well, if it's too long, the protocol works as intended, but we wait unnecessarily long times before we retransmit frames that have been lost or received in error. So it reduces the utilization. And this can be substantial if the probability that frames are errored is, is quite high. We should make sure that, that we choose a time which is appropriate. If it's too short on the other side, we end up doing timeout unnecessarily. And therefore, we will retransmit frames that actually have been delivered. If all delays are deterministic, we will retransmit all the time unnecessarily. And this is, of course, not a good idea. So how should the timeout be set to not be too long and not too short? Let's assume that the timer is set when the first bit of a frame is sent out. Then, of course, it has to include the full transmission time of the frame, so the time from the first until the last bit has sent out. It has to include the time from the last bit of the frame has been sent until the last bit of the frame has been received on the receiver side. So that is the delivery of the frame. Then it has to include all the time that the receiver need for error detection and for generating an acknowledgement before the acknowledgement can be sent back. It has to include the transmission time of the acknowledgement. It may be so small that we can ignore it, but it, it should list it here. And then we have the propagation time of the acknowledgement. This is not negligible because it's as long as the propagation time for the frame, typically, if they go over the same link. So all these components have to be included in the timeout. If there's any uncertainty in the estimates of these times, then we should make sure that the timeout is bigger than the sum of these times. So the question is, are these components constant? Well, the transmission time varies with the length of the frame, so, but here we can use the maximum frame length, which is typically set by the standard for the data link protocol. The processing time varies with the receiver, and if you have a link where there are different receivers, then there could be very different delays. One receiver could be a powerful computer, another one could be a Raspberry Pi or some simple embedded computer, and simply does not process frames as fast as, as the other computer does. So here you have to use some safe upper bound based on, on the use cases that could be in the system. What type of computers could be there, th the software implementation of those operating systems, and what could play a role in the processing time. So the propagation time depends on the link length. So it's fixed. You have to consider here that for certain links, the, the forward link from the sender to the receiver is not the same as a backward link. 
There are cases, for instance, when one link could be over a satellite connection and the other path could be on a terrestrial connection. In that case, they can differ quite a bit in distance and the propagation times will not be the same. But the point is that the timeout can be set quite well. You should ensure that the timeout is never too short because this is a serious design flaw. As we recall from flow control, stop and wait was in certain cases not very efficient. The transmission time for one frame was just a small fraction of, of the total time to deliver one frame and get the acknowledgement for the next frame. For the same reason, stop and wait ARQ will be inefficient also for long link. And we need to have a window of frames that can be sent before we expect any acknowledgement. So this is called continuous ARQ. And it's continuous because in ideal circumstances where all frames are delivered without error, then the sender should be able to use the full link and, and send frame after frame after frame and get acknowledgement in time before it gets halted and flow controlled. The AQ protocol uses sequence numbers for the, the frames in the sliding window and it uses timeout. There are two variants, go back N and selective reject. Let me go over go back N first. So it's based on the slider window flow control and the sender may send n frames without n acknowledgement. All the sent frames that have not been acknowledged are kept in transmission buffers on the sender side. The timeout work as for stop and wait. Now when we have several frames that have been unacknowledged, for go back n it means that all unacknowledged frames will be resent. The receiver works as before and it discards all frames with unexpected sequence number, just as we saw that the receiver did in the case of a lost acknowledgement for stop and wait. Since all unacknowledged frames are retransmitted, the receiver can simply discard frames that come out of order. They will be sent again and there's no sorting mechanism necessary at the receiver. And this is one of the reasons for go back N even though it retransmits frames that have been properly received. So let's look at, at an example with sliding window of four frames. So the sender has sent three frames and the receiver has received them and waits for frame three and therefore it sends an acknowledgement for fra frame three but this is the acknowledgement that's lost. So according to the protocol the sender will eventually time out and it's the timeout set at frame zero which will trigger first. And even though it's a timeout for frame zero only, it doesn't say anything whether F1 and F2 has been received. The protocol is such that you go back N frames and retransmit them. And here in this case, the N is uh, spanning from frame zero to frame two because these are the frames that have been sent. And the reason is for this that, that frame zero has to arrive to the receiver before frame one and frame two. If frame one and frame two would have been accepted and kept at the receiver, well, it would have to sort the frames when frame zero eventually would come. So therefore, all the frames are resent from frame zero, which is the one that timed out, and all the subsequent frames are resent. And here's a, an acknowledgement for those three frames, and it's expecting frame three, and frame three then is sent, and the protocol works as intended. Often when we look at protocols and talk about sequence number, we assume that they are not limited in any way. It's ju simply just an integer that is counted from zero up to, towards infinity. But in a real protocol, the sequence number is a protocol field and you would like to know how many bits you should specify in the protocol for that uh, function. So the sequence number will be finite. To get a good performance, you need to compute what type of sending window that you need. This is the same computation that we did for flow control to dimension the n so that we could get the full utilization. And then we have to make sure that the sequence number of bits is not only equal to n but it has to be a little bit larger than n. So if you have k bits sequence number the window size can at most be 2 to the power of k minus 1. So that means for 2 bits you can have 2 to the power of 2, 4, minus 1 a window size of 3. What's the reason for this? Well, frames can otherwise be duplicated at the receiver. The, the receiver cannot distinguish one sending window from another. This is how it can occur. An example, if we have sequence numbers 0 to 3, so this is incorrectly, you use all four sequence numbers, you should have used only three. But this is to illustrate the problem that can occur. So, the sender sends a full window 
from 0 to 3. The receiver acknowledges that window by asking for the next frame 0 because it has received the first frame 0. There's a timeout. And look now. The sender resends the previous window that it said once before. But the receiver cannot distinguish that window from a new window of frames. And therefore it will receive them as new frames. But they were duplicates of the previous frames. So you have introduced four duplicate frames into the data flow. And they will be delivered to a higher protocol layer. And you cannot know what the consequences that will have for the communication system. So this has to be avoided. If you would have used only three of the four sequence numbers, you would not have these problems. And you can convince yourself that that's the case. So this is how the continuous ARQ works. So it's a sliding window mechanism, and it follows very well the, the stop and wait, just allowing for more frames to be sent. But the bookkeeping on the sender receiver side of what has been sent and what is expected to be received are similar. Now we look at selective repeat ARQ. It's also sometimes called selective reject, so you may hear that term. There, you only retransmit frames that are lost. This is, of course, more efficient. Imagine that you have a very, very large send window. Say you have n for a satellite link that where n can be thousands of frames. And you have filled the whole link with frames. And the first frame is missing. Then a retransmission will mean that all those thousand frames will have to be retransmitted, even if only one of the frames was incorrectly received. So for such systems, where the number of frames on the link is very large, it's much more efficient to only retransmit frames that are lost. And for that you need another acknowledgement, an acknowledgement which says that if a certain frame has not been received, indicating that other frames have been received. And you need also a timeout, because you always have to be able to fall back on a timeout, because the negative acknowledgements might not be delivered. They can also be, of course, disappear. So the receiver has a, a receiver window, and only frames with sequence number with that receiver window are accepted. And then it sorts the accepted frame into order. So this is the difference with the go back n, because now frames are not delivered in the same order as they were intended to be sent and delivered from the sender side. There is a technicality here that you can work through yourself. If you have k bits sequence number, you can only use half of the possible span of sequence numbers for your window. Sequence number of 0 to 7 for 8 frames, you can only use a sending window of 4 frames. Otherwise, you risk of misinterpreting what frames are, are coming to the receiver, and again, duplicate frames will, would be accepted by mistake, and this cannot be accepted. So, in summary, we looked at the data link framing for a synchronous link and for an asynchronous link. We went over the stop and wait protocol and the sliding window protocol for flow control, showing that the main concern with flow control is to make sure that if there is no flow control from the receiver, it should be possible to use the full link capacity as has been provided at the physical layer. Then we start to think about links not being perfect, that uh, frames may disappear, because of framing delineation could be wrong, or there could be bit errors in the protocol data or in the data that the frame is carrying. And the most important solution to know there is the cyclic redundant check, which is a very powerful way of detecting errors. When frames are lost entirely, then you detect them by sequence numbers. And you expect the sequence numbers to increase by one for each received frame. And if there is a gap in sequence number, you can conclude that the intermediate frame has been lost. And now we looked at the error control, the automatic repeat request. So it builds on the flow control protocol, stop and wait. And you add a timer, for which a timeout means that an acknowledgement has not been received. It could be due to a frame loss or due to a loss of an acknowledgement. But it leads to the frame being retransmitted. And this can be generalized for a sending window of n frames into the go back n. And then, very briefly, I mentioned the selective repeat, which is a more efficient way of re doing retransmission where you have a full sending window and you try to send only the frames that are lost and not all the frames in the window as for go back end.